Good afternoon. <laughs> echoed with a microphone. Good afternoon, everyone. It's so nice to see everyone here in person, uh, the committee members, our committee staff, and those of you who have joined us in person. Welcome to the Assembly Committee on Commerce and Labor. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Assemblywoman Carlton. Here. Assemblywoman Considine. Present. Assemblywoman Dickman. <laughs> Assemblywoman Duran. Here. Assemblyman Flores. Present. Assemblyman Frierson. Here. Assemblywoman Hardy. Here. Assemblywoman Kasama. Here. Assemblywoman Martinez. Present. Assemblywoman Marzola. Here. Assemblyman O'Neill. Here. Assemblywoman Tolls. Here. Chair Howdy. Here. Everyone is present. Madam Secretary, please indicate all committee members are present and we have a quorum. Welcome to our audience who is tuning in over the internet. Before we start, I would like to make some housekeeping announcements. Please remember all exhibits, written testimony and amendments must be submitted by noon on the business day prior to the committee meeting. People wishing to provide testimony in person or virtually or on the phone must pre-register online at the legislature's website. The public is strongly encouraged to submit written testimony in advance of the meeting by emailing the Assembly Committee on Commerce and Labor. Members and presenters and people here in the audience, please remember to silence your electronics. Committee members will be using their electronics. Please know that is not a sign of inattention or disrespect. That is how many of us view exhibits and the bills that we are hearing today. Presenters who are with us on Zoom, please remember to be muted at all times and unmute yourselves to speak and then promptly mute yourself when you are done. And if you could please keep your cameras on so that we can continue to see if um, we need to call on you if a member has a question. Thank you everyone again and let's begin with our first agenda item. Today we have three bills that we will be hearing. I will now open the hearing on Senate Bill 35 which revises provisions relating to the Private Investigators Licensing Board. Madam Chief of Staff, thank you so much for joining us. When you are ready, please begin. Thank you, Chair, and it is lovely to be here in person. Uh, thank you, Chair Hoggy and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Jessica Adair. Thank you for allowing us to present Senate Bill 35 a bill to modernize the Private Investigator Licensing Board, commonly known as the PILB. I am joined virtually by Kevin Ingram, the Executive Director of the PILB. In 1969, the Nevada Legislature passed SB 67, a bill that mandated that, quote, the chairman of the board shall be the Attorney General or Deputy Attorney General designated by the Attorney General to act in such a capacity, end quote. The statute had previously required that the chief officer of the Nevada Highway Patrol serve as chair of the PILB. According to the LCB Research Division, the 1969 Senate Committee on Transportation did not keep minutes of its meetings, so the reasons for the statutory change may be lost to history. Perhaps the change was made because at the time, the Attorney General also served as the ex officio director of the Nevada Department of Highways, Perhaps it was because the position was important to then Attorney General Harvey Denver Dickerson. A.G. Dickerson's role as PILB chair was prominently featured on his campaign literature, seeking what would have been his fourth term as A.G. Much has changed in Nevada over the past 52 years since the PILB was placed in the A.G.'s office. The population has grown to 3 million. The legislature no longer typically accepts exhibits via Western Union Telegram and the Attorney General can no longer serve more than two terms. As the times change, so too must the PILB. In 2007, the Nevada State Legislature passed AB 531, which removed the Attorney General as chair and created a separate fund in the AG's office so the PILB could have some control over its finances. Fortunately, those minutes do exist. AB 531 was sponsored by then Attorney General Catherine Cortez Masto. Testimony indicates that the relationship between the PILB and the AG's office was unique even 14 years ago. No other occupational licensing board was financially connected to the AG's office, nor was the AG a member of any other licensing board, let alone serving as its chair. 
While the legislative change did give the PILB some independence, the board could not fully separate from our agency without being able to open its own bank account and be removed from the state's accounting system. The bill before you today op adopts authorizing language that is customary for many other occupational licensing boards that manage their own funds in accordance with state laws and fiduciary obligations. The PILB has a professional staff fully capable of managing its own affairs, and the existing system only serves to create needless bureaucracy. Thank you for your time hearing this bill, and uh, Mr. Ingram and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Now, was Mr. Ingram going to give remarks or just Q&A? Thank you, Chair, for the record, Jessica. Uh, just Q&A. Just Q&A. Perfect. Members, any questions? For Ms. Adair or Mr. Ingram, Assemblywoman Hardy, please. Thank you, Chair. And I guess just out of curiosity, how come it's taken so long to, to do this? Thank you for the question, Assemblywoman. Jessica, for the record, that is a great question. <laughs> and I don't know. So last session, um, we were not able to submit our own BDRs. They're pre-filed by the previous Attorney General. We did work with Mr. Ingram to submit a, uh, to amend an existing bill that would have done this, but that bill ended up not moving forward. So we waited until this session. Um, but I, I would be curious as to why they did not go ahead and make all of those steps in 2007, but that was not on the record. Thank you, Assembly Member Kasama. Thank you, Chair, uh, Assemblywoman uh, Kasama, Assembly District 2. Um, so this is basically making it a self-funding um, division or department. And it looks like the funds, none will revert back to the general fund. It will just remain in this account. How much is um, currently allocated um, to, to this division right now, funds on hand for this division? Uh, thank you for the question, Jessica Adair, for the record. So currently the uh, PILB does not receive any general fund, but you are correct that the interest that is gained on this account does usually refer to the general fund. This bill, the, it would not revert to the general fund. And that was the exact question that we um, answered in front of the Senate Finance Committee when this bill was heard on the Senate side. I believe when that was taken up in Senate Finance, it was about $30,000 a year in interest. And I am looking at Mr. Ingram, who is nodding, so I'm hoping that I am correct. So follow-up, Chair? So currently, the, so if it becomes self-funding, the money that is received is enough to handle all of the expenses with maybe about $30,000 a year uh, accumulating. Is, is that correct, roughly? Uh, thank, thank you for the question, Jessica Adair, for the record. So, so no, and I, I apologize if I was, my answer was not clear. So right now, the PILB is already self-funded. And they, um, I believe, have reserves up to six months on hand. And I'm, I'm going to let Mr. Ingram correct me <laughs> in this answer. So right now, they, the PILB does not receive any general fund. It's already self-funded. Mm -hmm. The only change to the general fund would be the interest on the account that is currently sitting in the AG's office as it is now. And that interest is about $30,000 a year that goes to the general fund but it is already a self-funded agency that is funded by fees from licenses for the, P the folks who are applying to become licensed through the PILB. But I, I'd like Mr. Ingram to weigh in here because this is his area of expertise. Thank you, Jessica. Kevin Ingram, for the record. Uh, you are correct, uh, Ms. Nair, that uh, we currently have uh, a reserve funding of about five and a half months uh, on hand right now, $916,000. Our, our annual budget uh, right now is about a $2.6 million budget. Uh, and we're required to carry the funds over from the previous year to start the funding uh, for the next fiscal cycle, uh, which again starts July 1. Um, without that reserve there, um, by being self-funded, we would start with a zero balance and not be able to pay the bills. So um, we carry forward uh, any remaining balance 
um, and uh, traditionally it's around the $900,000 mark. Uh, right now, uh, as the budget sits, uh, we have about 1.2 million in the budget right now. That's the uh, average uh, throughout the year, and that's what accumulates the uh, $30,000 in interest for the state general fund. Um, once removed uh, from the general fund and set up as all the other boards and commissions are, uh, we are totally self-sufficient. We're covering all the bills um, as, as we do now. Uh, the change would be that we would no longer be part of the state's fiscal uh, system and therefore would have to set up our own um, bank account to be able to pay and, and receive uh, funding. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, we will move into testimony in support. I will start with anyone here in Carson City who wishes to testify in support. Okay, broadcasting, can we go to the telephone line to see if there is anyone who wishes to testify in the support position? Yes, Chair, to testify in support of Senate Bill 35, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers for support at this time. Thank you so much. Okay, we will move into testimony in opposition. Is there anyone in Carson City wishing to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 35? Okay, seeing none broadcasting, can we please check the telephone line? To testify in opposition on Senate Bill 35, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Sure, there are no callers for opposition at this time. Thank you, Broadcasting. Okay, we will move into neutral testimony. Is there anyone in Carson City wishing to provide neutral testimony? Okay, seeing none, Broadcasting, can we please check the telephone line for anyone wishing to testify in the neutral position? To testify in neutral on Senate Bill 35, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers for neutral at this time. Thank you, Broadcasting. Ms. Adair, would you like to give any closing remarks? Uh, no, Chair. Thank you so much for hearing this bill and allowing me to present a little Nevada history, and it's lovely to see you all in person. Thank you. I will now close the hearing on Senate Bill 35. Okay, members, the next item on our agenda is Senate Bill 90. I see that we have Senator Hardy here with us. I will open the hearing on Senate Bill 90, which revises provisions relating to the regulation of providers of health care. Welcome, Senator Hardy. Thank you for joining us when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. I saw the sign that says, use hand sanitizer before you use the button to speak. Uh, we're in a new world. Uh, I appreciate uh, all of you being here and uh, appreciate the opportunity we have to be close to each other and someday I look forward to not having a mask. So speaking of Senate Bill 90, the rationale, I'm Senate, uh, I represent Senate number 12, Joe Hardy for the record. Uh, complaints about doctors can be very serious and sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're anonymous, and sometimes they are shown to not be worthy of taking any adverse action against the physician. It is not unusual for any professional board to deal with complaints without merit. And in the case of a physician being investigated for even a complaint without merit, the physician will have to admit to having been, quote, investigated for every license application or credentialing form 
for an insurance network. This must be justified and verified, which slows down the process to be to allow to be allowed to treat patients. We need more good physicians providing quality care for our Nevada citizens. We placed in statute AB 474 in 2017 uh, in a different way to approach complaints. When we use the words, quote, review and evaluate, unquote, as dealing with controlled substances. The propose, this proposed bill looks to use those same words if the, quote, review and evaluation, unquote, slows, uh, a pro shows a problem, it goes officially to an investigation. This would not do away with the process to determine if there has been wrongdoing or malpractice. We also put into statute a traffic violation that a traffic violation is not considered a misdemeanor for purposes of reporting for educational applications. So a student may be able to apply for progressive educational opportunities and positions without, without being marred by an inconsequential traffic violation. And when we look at changing to, quote, review and evaluation, unquote, that would hopefully shorten the time to resolve complaints by concentrating on those which are serious. Justice delayed is justice denied for those who are eventually cleared of wrongdoing. Two medical students, Ryan Briggs and Alan Hilton, uh, worked on suggestions that would perhaps help the safety climate of medical practice while assuring the quality of that care. And if you look at your exhibits, you have a big long exhibit that this bill deals with the last paragraph under discussion and the last sentence under conclusions. And the last sentence is uh, what we are concentrating on in SB 90. Uh, the two medical students are here to testify, as is one attorney, uh, Dr. Weldon Havens, who happens to be on the Board of Medical Examiners. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd be happy if they could have their opportunity to testify. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Senator Hardy. Members, I will um, remind you that to please silence your electronic devices. Please mute your computers and turn off your cell phones, please. When you're ready, let's go ahead and go to your co-presenter, Senator Hardy. Hi, my name is Dallin Hilton, and I am a Nevadan and a second year medical student at Toro University, Nevada. I intend to do my residency here in Nevada after medical school, and I also intend to practice here. My concern is that if anyone contacts the board with a complaint, we then have a stigma of being investigated for the entirety of our careers, regardless of whether the complaint was notorious. These investigations will have to be disclosed when applying for new employment, new training opportunities, or for future credentials. The review and evaluation process already exists in the Nevada law for controlled substance complaints. Those complaints are not considered investigations, so if the complaint is without merit, it is not carried forever by the physician. The physician will not carry the stigma of having been investigated for the rest of his or her career. The boards will still look into complaints and take actions on the ones that merit such, just as they do now. This is just a change in the wording to benefit physicians and to prevent unintentional or unmerited stigma. Uh, thank you for allowing me to advocate for SB 90. I believe this will benefit physicians and future physicians throughout Nevada. Thank you for your testimony. And Senator Hardy, was Mr. Briggs going to provide testimony? Mr. Briggs, when you're ready, we are ready for you. Thank you, Chair. Hello, and thank you for allowing me to speak. For the record, my name is student Dr. Ryan Briggs, and I am a second year medical student at Toro University of Nevada. I conducted research relating to this topic last summer, and you'll find our poster uh, in the exhibits. I am a Nevadan, and I hope to match into a Nevada residency to stay in practice in Southern Nevada. I have two daughters who will be entering into the Clark County education system. The oldest has expressed her desire to be a doctor too. As a future practicing physician in Nevada, I am in support of SB 90. I'm concerned that if anyone contacts the board with a complaint, 
within the board's jurisdiction, then I will be stigmatized uh, with an investigation, even though the board closes the complaint with no action. We found that, that the majority of complaints are closed without action. This means that physicians will have to answer to the affirmative when asked M if they Mr. have been Briggs, by I'm so sorry to yeah. interrupt your testimony, but is there any way we can get you um, to speak closer to your microphone? Our secretary can't hear your testimony and she needs it for the minutes. Uh, yes, one moment. Let's see if I can just unplug this. That better? Oh, perfect. Much better. Thank you so much, Mr. Briggs. We can hear you loud and clear now. Perfect. Would you like me to restart or pick up where I left off? If you don't mind, Mr. Briggs, that would be very helpful. Okay. Thank you for allowing me to speak. For the record, my name is student Dr. Ryan Briggs. I am a second year medical student at Toro University, Nevada. I conducted research relating to this topic last summer and you'll find my poster in the exhibits. I'm a Nevadan and I hope to match into a Nevada residency to stay and practice in Southern Nevada. I have two daughters who will be entering into the Clark County education system and the oldest has expressed her desire to be a, a doctor as well. As a future practicing physician in Nevada, I am in support of SB 90. I'm concerned that if anyone contacts the board with a complaint within the board's jurisdiction, then I will be stigmatized with an investigation, even if the board closes the complaint with no action. We found that the majority of complaints are closed without action. This means that physicians will have to answer to the affirmative when asked if they have been investigated by potential employers or hospital systems with which they are applying, uh, even though no wrongdoing was discovered. This could affect physician retention in the area where there's already a physician shortage. As my colleagues mentioned, there is already precedent. Um, there's already precedent for SB 90. In 2017, Assembly Bill 474 created a review and evaluation of complaints relating to controlled substance prescriptions. Under that law, a physician does not have to claim an investigation was opened if the executive director of a healthcare governing board determines that the licensee has not issued a fraudulent, illegal, or unauthorized or, other, or otherwise inappropriate prescription for a controlled substance. Senate Bill 90 will standardize that all complaints be treated equally under the law. Uh, in our research, we also found that most Nevada state boards treat controlled substance prescription complaints and all other complaints very similarly. Uh, some boards do not make a distinction. Uh, thank you, Chair and members of the committee for your time, and I hope you will consider voting yes on SB 90. Thank you, Mr. Higgs. Uh Members, do you have any questions for Senator Hardy? I will start with Speaker Frierson first. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my, my question, and I'm not sure who would be best uh, suited to answer it, is with respect to the investigations, uh, in, I, I don't know how it works, and so I'm, I'm asking uh, if there's an investigation, is the conclusion that it, the, the claim was without merit? or is the conclusion that uh, they were without sufficient information to decide one way or another, because there's a difference. If there are several similar complaints and it's one person's word against another, that doesn't mean it was without merit. That just means they were unable to, 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 to prove or verify uh, the claim. So I, maybe someone could tell me how it's reported out. If, if it's not confirmed, what is the alternative or is it a combination of both? And if, if you may, Madam Chair, uh, could I have uh, Dr. Attorney Wendell uh, Havens answer that or give his testimony at the same time? Oh. Yeah, I am sorry, Doc, I'm, I'm sorry, Senator Hardy. Did we jump to Q&A before your presentation was over? Uh, you never do anything wrong, Madam Chair. <laughs> I just noticed you said that's part of it. Yes, let's go ahead and go to Mr. Haven since he was part of the presentation. Thank too. you. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Are you able to hear me? Yes, Mr. Yes. Havens, we can hear you. Great. My name is Weldon Havens. I'm a physician and attorney uh, here in Nevada. I've been licensed to, to practice medicine since 1974, and uh, I passed the bar in 1998. Uh, I am a professor emeritus of medical jurisprudence and ophthalmology at Turo University. Uh, I'm a member of the uh, Nevada Board of Medical Examiners. Uh, although I am speaking as an individual and not for the board, uh, I've been a member of the board for four years now. Uh, although I have attended board meetings uh, since uh, September of 1999. Uh, 
the process is that when a, a, a complaint is received, uh, there is a judgment made is in the, in the board process of whether or not it's within the jurisdiction of the board. Uh, that uh, complaint then is uh, investigated or if it's a involves controlled substance, it uh, by law goes to the executive director or the executive director's designee. Uh, and then that it is uh, further information is obtained. If the board determines that there is insufficient information to proceed with the uh, complaint, then the claim is closed. Uh, if the, the if there is sufficient information or with additional expert uh, testimony, there is sufficient information to proceed, then a formal complaint is filed uh, against the licensee. That's how the process works for, to answer uh, the speaker's question. So the, it either goes forward or it's closed. And by going forward, a formal complaint is filed. So I am in, in, in favor of uh, SB 90. It would uh, remove the stigma of uh, claims, uh, complaints that don't have sufficient information to go forward uh, and that are closed from being uh, uh, labeling the licensee as, has been, as one that has been investigated. Uh, rather than a review and evaluation conducted. Uh, so it seems reasonable. This applies, it's gonna go in, assuming if it passes, it will go into 629. So it'll actually apply to uh, all the Title 54 boards and occupations as far as I understand, which will uh, benefit particularly, it's particular of interest for physicians um, because of being labeled uh, having uh, been investigated, and that does create issues whenever you're applying for a license or uh, other uh, credentials with healthcare organizations and hospitals, for instance. So, uh, in sum, I'm an advocate, advocate for SB 90. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, th thank you. Um... I don't think you answered my, my question, or that, that, although that was insightful. Uh, my, my question is as it relates to the comment in the introduction of claims uh, that were without merit. And uh, as an attorney, I, I certainly recognize uh, concepts of due process. But my, my question is, is the closing of a case, is there a distinction between a claim that's without merit and a claim that was without sufficient information and does AB90 propose to treat both the same? Uh, uh, currently, uh, and Mr. AB90. Havens, if you would just identify yourself for the record for our committee secretary. Uh, Weldon, Thank you. Uh, yes, Weldon Havens, uh, speaking as an individual. Uh, the There is no distinguishing between a claim that uh, is without merit or one that has insufficient evidence to proceed uh, to a formal complaint. They're treated the same. That is, they're closed. Uh, thank you. And one, one more follow-up. Uh, and this is a practical uh, question about how it happens in real life. If, if uh, a physician ultimately has an investigation that is sustained or, or results in the filing of a formal complaint, would they then be able to go back and look at any of the previous uh, complaints that were closed to, to see if it was involving similar conduct, even if they don't have to acknowledge it because it wasn't sustained. If there was ultimately yes. one that was, would they have? Would they be able to see that history? Yes. So I'm on an investigative committee for the board. Again, I'm not speaking for the board. There's Weldon Havens. I'm sorry. Again, uh, speaking uh, to the speaker. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, I'm on an investigative committee of the board, and we receive these uh, complaints and the results of inquiry into the complaint. And we have, when we make a judgment, uh, we do have prior complaints uh, that are listed that were closed. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. 
And I, I'm going to follow up on what speaker's line of questions were, Mr. Havens. And so the, you're taking it from an investigation, which is if they're, if, if it's found, if the complaints found not to be legitimate, they, the investigation's closed and it's not public. Would the information in a review and evaluation be public or private? If there, if there is no action, well in Havens, uh, to the chair, uh, if there is no action taken, that is, if it is closed, uh, then that's not you know, available to the public currently and with SB 90, it would be the same. Oh, okay, so the, then it would remain status quo. If, it was, if it's an investigation or a review and evaluation and it would remain closed to the public if the claim was found. That's right, uh, it's not, that's correct. It's not available to the public. But it, it is available to investigators. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you for answering my questions. Members, any other questions? Vice Chair Carlton. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And nice to see you, Dr. Havens. I hope you're doing well. Thank um, you. So um, in, in reading the bill, and I had a lot of the same uh, questions that, that speaker had. Um, I guess I'm going to go to uh, the portion of the bill where this just doesn't affect doctors. There's a lot of different citations in here for a lot of different boards. And I was just wondering, um, Senator Hardy, have the other boards weighed in on this? Because this isn't specifically for the board that you're here and a member of, but not speaking on behalf of. But I'm just wondering, was this circulated to the other boards? and? What were their thought processes on this? Because each board, believe me, we know what these turf battles can be like with these boards. Um, and you're actually taking an issue that you believe you have and fixing a problem that may not necessarily exist in the other boards. Thank you, Madam Chair. If I may, through you to uh, Assemblywoman Carlton. You can go directly to the members, Senator Hardy. Thank you. So I made a list, uh, I got a list of the boards, for instance, that it alludes to, and uh, we uh, did not keep this hidden, and that's why you have an exhibit that talks about a uh, you know, fiscal notes that are all zero. So that means, in the way I look at it, that they had a chance to look at it and said this would not increase their costs. And if I may, Madam Chair, that uh, a fiscal note doesn't necessarily indicate support, opposition, or concerns from, from other boards. You're, you're actually changing how other boards will be handling these complaints, not just for um, doctors or osteopaths, P MDs, DOs. You're changing it for a lot of other folks. And I was just wondering if they had weighed in on it on the Senate side. Uh, not through you, Madam Chair, but directly to Assemblywoman Carlton. You are absolutely correct. Um, I have not had, quote, testimony, unquote, by the other boards as much as a tacit admission that they sought because they developed a no fiscal note. And, and fiscal notes relate to state funding and all boards are self-funded, so naturally there wouldn't be a fiscal note. So um, thank you very much, Madam Chair. My, my concern lies with we are making a decision that will impact a number of different boards across the spectrum that may not have this particular problem. So thank you very much. Thank you for your questions, Vice Chair Carlton. Members, any other questions? Assemblyman O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think I know the answer, but I just want to clarify. How would this affect if one of the doctors goes out of state and applies for credentialing or privileges out of state? Do they have to, how would they report their uh, reviews slash or investigations? Thank you, Assemblyman O'Neill. So the way I look at this, if you're a physician and you go anywhere and apply for anything. There's little boxes that you check. One of those boxes is, have you ever been investigated? So this is if they are reviewed and evaluated and that they have not had a problem, 
that did not go above review and, ev and evaluation, then they would still be able to say, no, I have not been investigated. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the time. Assemblywoman Duran. Um, Assemblyman O'Neill just asked my question. <laughs> okay, thank you. Assemblywoman Tolls. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm in the same boat. I'm good. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, I will move into testimony in support. Is there anyone in Carson City wishing to provide testimony in support of Senate Bill 90? Okay, seeing none, broadcasting, can we please check the telephone lines? To testify in support on Senate Bill 90, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 836. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Hi, for the record, this is Jessica Ferrato, J E S S I C A F E R R A T O, today here on behalf of the American College of Emergency Physicians. Just wanted to express my support of the bill and thank the senator for bringing it forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Ferrato. Broadcasting, next caller, please. To testify in support on Senate Bill 90, please press star, not, excuse me, star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no more callers in support. Thank you. Is there anyone here in Carson City wishing to testify in opposition? Okay, broadcasting, can we check the telephone line, please? To testify in opposition on Senate Bill 90, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers for opposition at this time. Thank you. Is there anyone in Carson City wishing to testify in the neutral position? Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, nice to be here uh, on the 80th day of their session. My name is Keith Lee. I represent the State Board of Medical Examiners. We are the licensing and regulatory authority over the allopathic physicians, NRS 630, uh, NRS chapter 630. Um, and, and I just want to clear up, uh, we take no position on the, on the policy issue you're addressing here, but I, I, at least my understanding of where we went in the testimony and the answers and the questions today is that there might be some confusion with respect to what complaints there are and, and how they're handled. And if I may, uh, Madam Chair, there are essentially two types of complaints. We refer to them as, as complaints. One is a complaint uh, with, that we call a consumer complaint. That is a complaint that's authorized by NRS 630.307. That is to say, if you're a patient and you feel um, there was some mistreatment of you, uh, you may file a complaint with the State Board of Medical Examiners. If uh, upon that receipt, uh, upon receipt of that complaint, a file is opened. It doesn't matter what the complaint is, but it's opened. And then the first question that is, is uh, looked at is, does this complaint address an issue that the Board of Ju uh, Medical Examiners has jurisdiction over? For instance, one that commonly comes in that, for which we have no jurisdiction under Chapter 630 is a, is a billing issue. The doc overbilled me, whatever. We, we immediately close that because we have no jurisdiction. If we determine we have jurisdiction under the Practice Act, then we open an informal investigation. Uh, it's referred to the to uh, internal investigators. Uh, they look at it. 
if at that point in time, after the investigation and some cases, information's gathered, witnesses are talked to, whatever, and if it's determined then that there is no basis to go forward, that either as Mr. Speaker indicated, there's, it's without merit or there's not sufficient evidence to proceed in either situation, the case is closed. <clears throat> and under chapter, or under NRS 630.336.4, the fact of the receipt of the complaint, all information gathered pursuant to that complaint, uh, and the decision to not proceed further is confidential. And the practitioner or the licensee is not required to report that. The second type of complaint, of course, is the one that, that were, uh, where after the initial investigation, it is determined there is a uh, potential practice act violation or probable uh, the, the uh, statute reads uh, a reasonable basis for it, I believe. Then that complaint is opened, it's investigated, it either goes to hearing or non-punitive action or is dismissed. In any case, once that formal complaint is filed, that complaint, all the information gathered pursuant to that complaint, and the ultimate disposition is a matter of public record. And that is what any physician or any licensee has to report if, uh, to answer the question, have we ever been investigated? With that, Madam Chair, I'll try to answer any questions, but I hope that's not muddied the water, but clarified it. But I'll, I'll try to answer any questions if I haven't uh, done a good job doing that. Thank you so much for being here, Mr. Lee. I believe we do have some questions for you. I will start with Vice Chair Carlton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Mr. Lee. It's very nice to see nice. you in the building. Thank you. So you're, you're speaking from the MD side of the equation. That's, that's, that's the board that you're with. Uh, are you aware is this same provision um, within the DO board? Is because, and, and you heard my concerns earlier that we're making a change um, that I believe they're seeing in one board that may not necessarily hold true in other boards. So to your knowledge, is this same provision in the DO board? Uh, uh, nice to be here, uh, Assemblywoman Carlton. Nice to see you and, and all, all of my uh, friends and some of you I have not yet met. I hope I get be able to meet you. Um, I, I don't. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. I do know, and you know, you know as well as any of us that we have tried over the years to match Chapter 630 and Chapter 633, so that if it applies to an MD, it ought to apply to a DO as well. And so, so I can't really speak to that. I haven't looked at that. Um, uh, maybe Dr. Hardy can, but. Uh, I know our goal has always been to match the two, and so if in fact it has been matched, then um, I, would, I would suspect that what I've related to you is how we handle complaints and what becomes confidential and what becomes public would be the same, but I, I, that's presumption on my part. And, and thank you, and I know over the years we have tried to align those two boards as much as possible every session. There's usually some type of tweak that needs to be done, yep. so I think that's probably one of the answers to a number of these questions that we need to address m moving forward. Mm -hmm. But as I said earlier, my big concern is that there are a lot more boards impacted than just the DO board. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, any other questions? I do have one for you, Mr. Lee. You had mentioned that when a complaint comes to the board, um, if it's a consumer complaint, you the first thing you have to do is determine whether you have jurisdiction over that complaint. Um, what type of complaints do you have jurisdiction over? You mentioned a billing um, complaint. You don't. What would be some of those complaints? Uh, uh, Madam Chair, Keith Lee, for the record. Um, I don't think I could detail them now without looking at it. They are provided in the Practice Act, uh, Chapter 630, and, and uh, um, uh, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but it's generally with respect to uh, the quality of care, whether there's been a malpractice, potential malpractice, um, Sometimes it has to do with, with, uh, with records themselves. Uh, as many of you are aware, uh, we have a, a substantial uh, health record keeping policy both in the state and, and under HIPAA and the federal, so there's oftentimes violations with respect to that. But I think, and this is just my presumption more than anything, Madam Chair, is that probably most of the complaints have to do with the quality of care With your permission, Madam Chair, what I will do is send to, to uh, all of you and the committee, uh, committee uh, secretary uh, the provisions of Chapter 630 that, uh, that uh, are, would constitute a violation of the, of the Medical Practices Act. 
That would be great, Mr. Lee, if you could send it to our committee secretary or committee manager so she can distribute it to the committee members. I do have a couple of more questions for you, uh, Mr. Lee. So, um, so you had also mentioned that a consumer complaint comes in and you, you have jurisdiction over it. You assign internal investigator. But if there is no basis to go forward, then you don't go forward. It's not considered an investigation. They don't have to report that. So they would never have to check that box that says they've been under investigation because there was no merit for an investigation. So that kind of alleviates that um, part, I think, that they were trying to address. And then if there is enough merit to open an investigation, that's because there was something there uh, to open an investigation. And then that's when they would go um, to a hearing. And if the hearing outcome was, you know, um, there was, you know, it wasn't sufficient or, you know, there was no merit, then it would remain closed, but they would still have to check that box that we've been investigated, but we were not found guilty of the investigation. Okay. And so now if SB 90 passes, then the consumer complaint comes in, there's no, there's insufficient merit. So then that, that goes away. But if there is merit, it goes to the investigation. If they weren't found guilty, then it would become a, an eval a review and evaluation. And I think, okay, is that correct? That's, uh, Madam Chair, Keith Lee for the record. That's my understanding of, uh, you are correct in the first part of, of how we handled under current law. And as I read SB 90, I think the way you, you uh, stated it is, is accurate. So, um, uh, the, but I, and I, I guess, I, and I've looked at SB 90 and I've read it, and I believe I'm correct in that if the complaint that if the informal complaint the complaint the complaint we received uh, pursuant to uh, point three zero seven um, uh, proceeds to a formal complaint then i think under sb 90 that's still a reportable uh, that the the practitioner would then still have to check the box that he or she has been investigated if i understand sb 90 correctly okay perfect that answers my question okay thank you so much mr lee members any questions for mr lee Okay. Thank you, um, broadcasting, could we please check the telephone line for anyone wishing to testify in the neutral position? Yes, Chair. To testify in neutral on Senate Bill 90, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers for neutral at this time. Okay, Senator Hardy, would you like to give closing remarks, please? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Hardy. I will now close the hearing on Senate Bill 90. Okay, our last bill on today's agenda is Senate Bill 103. I will now open. I will now open the hearing on Senate Bill 103, which prohibits certain insurers from discriminating based on the breed of dog at a property. Thank you so much for being here, Senator Scheibel. When you are ready, the floor is yours. Do you have a presentation? Nothing to project on the screen. I'm reading from notes on my computer, if that's okay. All right, thank you so much, um, Chair Haudegui and members of the Assembly Committee on Commerce and Labor. Um, my name is Melanie Scheibel. I represent the 9th District uh, of the Senate in Nevada. And today I'm here to present Senate Bill 103 for your consideration, which prohibits property insurers from discriminating based on the breed of dog at a property. Unfortunately, some dogs are unfairly deemed dangerous or vicious solely because of their breed. However, animal experts will tell you that dogs are not born inherently vicious. Rather, they are trained to behave in a dangerous manner. In 2013, the Nevada legislature recognized this to be true and acted by banning dog breed discrimination in NRS 202.500. Currently, 21 states, like Nevada, prohibit local authorities from adopting or enforcing an ordinance or regulation that deems a dog dangerous because of its breed alone. In 2019, we again enacted pet-friendly legislation to ensure that no family ever has to choose between their home and keeping an animal family member. 
Assembly Bill 161 made it clear that a homeowner's association could not prohibit a unit owner from keeping at least one pet within his or her residence, subject to the reasonable restrictions on pet ownership. And Senate Bill 367 of the 2019 session authorized a tenant of housing acquired, constructed, or rehabilitated with any money from the account for low income housing to keep one or more pets within his or her residence. Although Nevada has made strides to become a pet friendly state, residents are still finding themselves in a position where insurance companies are making them choose between being able to obtain or afford or maintain property insurance or give up their dogs to animal shelters. Many insurance companies consider a dog's breed when deciding whether to offer an individual homeowner's insurance or the rate they will charge. Even though research has demonstrated that there is no reliable data supporting making a distinction between breed, nor is there evidence that insurance claims for these breeds is financially significant for insurers. In a list of factors utilized in underwriting homeowner pro policies provided to me by the American Property Casualty Insurance Association, breed of dog is nearly unique in its targeted application based on a homeowner's lifestyle decisions unrelated to the condition of their home or property. The factors provided included the cost to rebuild the home, not the same as the purchase price, but the uh, cost of replacement using information about your home and its contents, whether your home is made of brick or wood, the premium is usually lower for homes that are primarily brick, the distance from your home to a water source or fire department and the quality of your community's fire protection services, the age and condition of the home, the claims history of your home and homes in your area, your insurance score, having protection devices in your home, such as smoke detectors, a burglar alarm, a sprinkler alarm, a sprinkler system, deadbolts on doors or security devices for windows, and many insurers offer discounts if you have these, having a wood furnace or wood stove, having a swimming pool, operating a business in your home, and finally, the type of pets you home, the type of pets you own. Apparently, insurance underwriters are concerned about whether homeowners have mutts adopted from the local shelter, but do not consider whether homeowners keep loaded guns in an accessible area of their home when determining the amount of insurance they're going to charge. The 15-year U.S. dog bite fatality chart provided to you by the APCIA and the attached exhibit in opposition to my bill is devoid of a citation, making it impossible for you or me to determine where the data came from to create the pie chart and the soundness of that analysis. The chart in the opposing testimony also does not provide any connection between the cost of a dog bite claim of the alleged breed of dog and the alleged breed of dog involved. A rise in the volume or cost of dog bite claims on the whole does not indicate that a certain breed is more dangerous than others. In addition, the written testimony provided by the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies has absolutely no citations to any scientific, academic, or other authorities to support its claim that certain breeds of dogs are more dangerous than others. To the contrary, NAMIC reminds us that pets are like children, yet children are not a recognized factor in underwriting formulas. Senate Bill 103 would prohibit breed discrimination by insurance companies and instead require them to look at whether the dog has a vicious history. Currently, Michigan through underwriting rules and Pennsylvania statute prohibit insurers from denying coverage to homeowners based on the breed of their dog, nor can they exclude a dog from liability coverage. Senate Bill 103 prohibits an insurer from refusing to issue, cancel, renew, sorry, from refusing to issue, canceling, renewing, or increasing the premium or rate for a policy of property insurance based solely on the specific breed or mixture of breeds of dogs that is located on the property, unless that particular dog is known or declared to be vicious or vicious in accordance with NRS 202.500. Subsection 3 of Section 1 also prohibits an insurer from asking or inquiring about the specific breed or mixture of breeds of a dog located on insured property or proposed to be insured. However, an insurer may ask if the dog is known to be or has been declared to be dangerous or vicious in accordance with NRS 202.500. In closing, I thank you for the opportunity to present this bill and I urge your support. I'm also joined by Susan Riggs of the American Association to Prevent Cruelty Against Animals. And if you will allow her to provide some comments and elucidate the importance of the bill and the, um, and the structure of the policy. Thank you. Ms. Riggs, when you're ready, you can proceed. Ms. Riggs, I'm so sorry, I believe you are muted. No, we still cannot hear you. Uh, Senator Scheibel, was Mr. Dixon part of your presentation? Would you like to go to him next? I think Mr. Dixon is here to answer questions, okay. but um, if we could get Ms. Riggs back online. 
it looks like she might have jumped off and maybe she's coming back on. Why don't we give her a second to jump back on? I appreciate your patience. Welcome back, Ms. Riggs. Let's try this again. My apologies. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Please proceed. Oh, good. Okay. It's strange because I tested my mic before too. Um, well, good afternoon, uh, Chair Hadegi and members of the committee. My name is Susan Riggs and I'm Senior Director of State Legislation with the ASPCA. Uh, um, and thank you, Senator Scheibel, for your comments. Um, as mentioned, in 2013, this esteemed body passed Assembly Bill 110, sponsored by your colleague, the Honorable James Orenshaw. The bill prohibited government regulation of dogs based upon breed throughout the state in favor of a paradigm that addressed the nature of an individual dog based upon its behavior. At that time, then Assembly Member Orenshaw was quoted as saying, it has always been a bad public policy to enact ordinances that target a certain breed of dog without considering that individual dog's actions. The statement captures the growing consensus among both the public and private sector that breed specific laws have failed. At the time of AB 110's passage, there were 14 states that explicitly prohibited breed-specific regulation of dogs, and this number has now grown to 21 states and many, many jurisdictions throughout the country. These states add to a long list of organizations that have looked at fact and science and rejected breed-based regulation of dogs. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the American Bar Association, the American Veterinary Medical Association, just to name a few. So today I'm gonna to focus my testimony on the facts and science on which this consensus is built. Facts and science that lead to a, a strong conclusion that regulation by breed is ineffective and highly punitive to both innocent dogs and their responsible dog owners. This as mentioned by Senator Seibel is in, Seibel is in contrast to the testimony of the associations rep representing the opposition that have been unable to cite any facts or scientific evidence. So first, the identification by breed by appearance is wholly imperfect endeavor, even by experts. The National Canine Research Council has written extensively about the weakness of visual identification of dog breeds, citing numerous expert studies. The overwhelming conclusion is that it is highly flawed. If you're in doubt, I challenge each of you to do a web search for breed identification quizzes, like the one that's included in our letter to you in support of SB 103, and try your hand at it. Even as an animal welfare professional, I'm regularly unable to identify the breeds featured in the quizzes. That said, property insurance companies regularly rely upon visual identification of dog breeds. So as the saying goes, garbage in, garbage out. The reliance on breed in determining insurance coverage results in is inaccurate and inequitable outcomes that should be corrected. Second, even if the breed of a dog is clear, for example, in the case of a dog from a breeder with papers, breed is not an accurate indication of whether a dog will be aggressive or pose a risk to public health and safety. According to the American Veterinary Medical Association, it is the dog's individual history, behavior, general size, number of dogs involved, and the vulnerability of the person bitten that determines the likelihood of a biting and whether a dog will cause a serious bite injury. Furthermore, scientific studies have determined that the most common cause of fatal dog attacks are preventable factors related to irresponsible dog ownership, abuse and neglect, failure to neuter dogs, and failure to properly supervise dogs around infants and children. Given the variety of factors that have been shown through science to be determinative, it is of no surprise that local governments that regulate solely by breed continue to see high bite statistics. The approach has been shown time and time again to be short-sighted, knee-jerk reaction to regulation that does, no, does more to de degrade public safety than improve it. And Nevada has already acknowledged the facts and sciences in, in, um, in an existing dangerous dog law, and yet the law isn't as effective as it could be as long as households with restricted breeds are denied insurance coverage. It's important to note that this bill would not hinder insurance companies' underwriting of particular risks. To the contrary, it allows insurers latitude in evaluating insurance for such risk. Consistent with existing state law, SB 103 simply states that each dog judged independently based upon its own temperament and behavior in making underwriting decisions. Furthermore, the legislation specifically reserves insurers' latitude to cancel, refuse to issue or renew, or to increase premiums for households in which a resident's dog of any breed has been found to be dangerous pursuant to section 202.500. And in direct response to conversations with industry groups, we have amended the bill 
in the assembly to broaden the standard under which an insurance company can underwrite potential risks associated with dogs. This amendment goes straight to the heart of statements made in, in an opposition letter that an insurer would have to wait for a personal injury to occur in order to understand risk. And applying the standards set forth in the admitted tax, an insurer can easily determine whether a dog poses a risk without inquiring about its breed. SB 103 specifically reserves to the insurance companies the use of sound underwriting and actuar actuarial principles reasonably related to actual losses or loss experienced with a particular dog. As such, it strikes a reasonable balance between insurers underwriting autonomy and the various ill effects of insurance companies treating all dogs of certain breeds as bad dogs and punishing the people who live with them. Wisely, Nevada state law has for years required government entities to create more effective policies for regulating dangerous dogs. We ask for your I vote on SB 103 to ask companies providing property insurance in your state to be held to the same standard. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Riggs. At this point, we will go to questions from the committee. Members, do you have any questions for Senator Scheibel or her co-presenter? Speaker Frierson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and, and thank you, Senator. Good to see you here. Uh, and thank you. I, I actually think this is a um, sound policy. Uh, I, I noticed in one of the exhibits uh, the listing of breeds, Akita of, of, of which was one of them. Uh, and I, ha I have to say I had an Akita for 14 years that was the sweetest dog I've ever had. But I also have a lab right now that is a terror. <laughs> and so my, my, my question is, would this prohibit uh, a decision b based not specifically on the breed for breed's sake, but size? Because I, I think if you're in a, a community, for example, with small children and there are some limitations because a big dog might not be aggressive, but might be a big dog that might be more prone by virtue of its size uh, to, to, to result in an injury to a child, for example. Would this pro prohibit, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is if I move into an apartment and I have a, a dog that's 12 pounds, but it's a puppy and it ends up being a breed, a Great Dane, and so over time it's gonna get bigger, uh, there, I guess I'm wondering if there is a use for inquiry into a breed for the purpose of assessing it, not because of the danger of the breed, but because it might be big and they might have an issue with wanting to, to not have a, a large dogs, for example. Thank you for the question. Melanie Scheibel, for the record. And I think that um, the answer can kind of be found in NRS 202.500, which is the dangerous and vicious dogs policy or the statute in Nevada. And the short answer to your question would be that they can still inquire about the size of the dog. That is still a valid consideration. Um, but the dispositive question is whether or not the dog is dangerous or vicious. So size could certainly uh, play into danger, but NRS 202.500 gives both parties whether, you know, and which in this case would be a person who owns the, a pet and um, an underwriting company or an insurance underwriter, both of them opportunities to go through a series of factors that weigh the animal's dangerousness. So for example, a very large, very young, very active dog uh, might also be different from a very large, very old and feeble dog um, that is not capable of inflicting the same kind of harm. So I, I hope that answers your question, that size could be included, but uh, we, the purpose of the bill is to direct people to NRS 202.500, which outlines the specific behaviors, qualities, indicators of aggression and dangerousness or viciousness in dogs. Hi, it's Susan Riggs. Could I, could I add a little bit of context as well? Yes, Ms. Riggs, please. Thank you so much. Um, so existing Nevada law actually does prohibit um, insurance companies from use, utilizing um, underwriting standards that are arbitrary and capricious. And so in order to, um, there's no prohibition in SB 103 from asking about that, but they would need to establish that there is a relationship between the size of the dog and the propensity to bite. And that, that's exactly at, at the heart of why we brought SB 103 forward. Um, what often happens, and I, some of you may have received emails from um, folks asserting, you know, certain dangers associated with certain breeds of dogs. What often happens, and as I alluded to in my remarks, is 
a lot of times there are there's unsupervised interactions with children who end up putting their faces in prox, you know in proximity to a dog's mouth and the dog feels uncomfortable and threatened and there's a dog bite in the face and that is regardless of whether it's a chihuahua or a great dane and so and the damage is very similar because it is a bite to a child's face that obviously they have to live with for you know their lifetime. So, so to the extent that there can be justification and data that substantiates um, the need to underwrite based upon size, they can do that. But there is that prohibition under Nevada existing Nevada law. Thank, you. Assembly Member Duran. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Senator Scheibel for bringing the bill forward. Uh, my concern is what are some of the circumstances that uh, an insurer would be allowed or are canceling your policy out and does it just the dog portion of it or is it your entire policy? If I'm understanding the question correctly, you're asking what, what the current practice is that we're trying to stop. Um, and what we are seeing is that there are individuals who and I think this is you, I'm not sure if this is what you meant to do, but you bring up another interesting point where individuals who are not disclosing animals on their property or not giving accurate information to insurance companies about the types of dogs that are on their property are able to renew their insurance policies, um, which are generally homeowners insurance policies or renters policies that cover your basic property and casualty insurance for, you know, that's what most of us walk around carrying. Um, and then people who honestly tell their insurers, oh, I got a, an Akita this year, um, will suddenly see that their policy has been canceled. Um, and they will, that insurer will refuse to renew the policy or they will refuse to renew that particular policy and say, you have to buy this more expensive policy um, if you're gonna have an Akita in this house that we previously insured at this other rate. And if I, I'm not sure if I said that I'm Melanie Scheibel for the record. Follow up, Assembly Member Duran. Go ahead. So basically, would they um, tell you, or they just cancel you and just tell you you have to purchase a higher rate, or if you have an Akita? Um, it would generally happen during the renewal phase that the that the policy would be canceled, um, and that would be a different provision of NRS, which I am also learning about as a new member of Commerce and Labor on the Senate side and what information the insurance company is required to share with you. Um, but it would generally be during the renewal portion um, that they would get new information about, or when you first go to buy the policy, uh, that they would get information about an animal on the property and make a decision based solely on the breed. Thank you. Assembly Member Kasama. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've had dogs my, my whole life, and when I was younger, I had a, a Labrador that must have been um, a cousin to Speaker Frierson's lab because it wanted to kill every dog it ever saw, which is unusual for, for labs. But um, my question is, when I, 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 I'm looking at the chart um, presented by the insurance company, and it talks about the 15-year U.S. dog bite fatality chart from 2005 to 2019. And I understand what the testimony has been about. Um, perhaps there's no um, scientific evidence as to why one dog is more vicious than another. But it, it shows here the fatality chart, and clearly it shows, you know, an overwhelming percentage for certain breeds. And so... How, how how does that all work when the insurance companies are risk, you know, they use risk analysis for their pricing, and it, it seems to me like that's just a fact of what they're dealing with. Um, how, how do you work with the insurance company when they're trying to, I mean, insurance is risk-based pricing. How, how does this fit into, this seems to me, this is just factual, so. Uh, thank you for the question. This is Melanie Scheibel for the record. And, um, I wish I could make a determination as to whether or not it was factual. What I asked the APCIA for was the data that they utilized to input to their actuarial 
calculations because insurance, as you said, it is a risk-based cost assessment. And so you have to be using some kind of number. I asked them, do you utilize this number? And they said, no. That's, that's from dogbites.org. I don't know where this number comes from. And if you hear frustration in my voice, it's because I am frustrated. I am willing to engage in a robust conversation with the insurance industry about the data that they're utilizing. And um, you know, I'm open to, to learning new facts and um, adjusting the, the bill and even adjusting my position. But what we haven't been presented with are, OK, here are statistics from a reputable source. We utilize the statistic to calculate this risk, whereas we can do that with other things. We can, they can provide us with information in car insurance and saying that, okay, cars without seatbelts, not that there are any anymore, but you know, we can look at the transportation authorities' numbers on accidents of certain kinds of cars or cars with certain features or without certain features. We can look at um, the number of homeowners' claims that come from a roof made of a certain material, and we can talk to the fire department about roofs that tend to catch on fire and don't catch on fire. But in this case, we are missing that data from an objective source that says that any one breed of dog is more vicious, more likely to bite, or more likely to cause a serious bite. We have, I agree, I'm looking at the chart too. The numbers are there, but the citation is not. Hi, um, Susan Riggs. Can I can I add a little a little bit of context as well? So uh, again, um, the um, citation is missing, so we really don't know where the data is coming from. But I can tell you, um, based upon experience, um, the data that um, has been utilized in um, prior correspondence um, hasn't utilize any scientific methodology for identifying what the actual breed is. It's based upon, again, visual identification. And again, I, I would encourage any of you to go to um, the coalition letter that, that I submitted and or just Google um, dog breed identification quizzes. And you will find that visual identification of dog breeds is, it, it's a joke. And so, you know, to the extent that this data is being derived, which generally it has been, um, in my experience, by visual identification, calling something a pit bull is not necessarily at all a pit bull. And you will find that that's the case time and time again. And there have been many, many scientific studies that, that um, support the fact that visual identification is a very inaccurate way to proceed with making policy. And that is why so many states and so many jurisdictions now preclude that and just rely upon the behavior of the particular um, individual dog. Thank you. Thank you. And Senator Scheibel, I just, just because I need to keep the record clear, but I am looking at one of the exhibits provided and the chart that shows the number of um, bites per breed. Just for the record clear, because you said there was no citation, it does have a citation on there. I, I, and are we looking at, the, this is Melanie Scheibel for the record. Uh, is this the exhibit? Dated Wednesday, April twenty first. This is this is new, um, and I do see what you're referring to. For if if I could clarify, <laughs> yes, Senator Scheibel, please. Okay, Melanie Scheibel. For the record, I am looking at a letter uh, dated today, Wednesday, the twenty first of April, from the American Property Casualty Insurance Association, and indeed they have cited to a study from the mid nineties from the CDC. They've provided a link to that, um, and I see that the the chart that they've put in their letter is also available at that link. This is the first time I have seen the link, so perhaps it does indeed come from the CDC, which is a better source than dogbites.org, and I will certainly be digging into this after the hearing. Thank you, Senator Scheibel, and I believe we do have a couple more questions for you. Assemblywoman Considine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Scheibel, for bringing um, this bill forward. I have a question. Um, the bill itself does not prohibit an insurance company from asking an owner um, of an animal their history if they have been sort of repeatedly sued for dog uh, for dog bites or for um, to determine whether or not that owner needs a higher level of insurance. As a lifelong do um, dog and animal owner and rescue owner, I know that it, it the reflection is more about the owner than is the dog. So I just want to make sure that an insurance company has the ability to ask questions about the owner's responsibilities. 
Melanie Scheibel, for the record, um, except as otherwise prohibited by law, you know, other type forms of discrimination that aren't allowed in insurance underwriting, yes, they could absolutely ask the animal owner or the person seeking the um, insurance policy about their own history of claims or, um, I guess, any other allowable questions that, that would point towards whether or not it's the some quality of the owner that causes concern and increases the risk. Follow up, Assembly Member? You, okay. Perfect. Assembly Member Tolls? Yes, thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Scheibel. Good to see you in this committee and in person here. Um, and so as I summarize what this bill is doing, we're essentially move, we're, we're moving from blanket prohibitions against a breed to behavior. And I appreciate you referencing NRS uh, 202.500 because I do read here to follow up with my colleague that um, there's you actually have it written in under section one subsection two that that they can ask um, that the insurance company can ask about the the basis of a particular dog. So that's that piece of asking about past behavior according to NRS 202.500. Now I'm looking at NRS 202.500 and cross-referencing it with your subsection three, which is an insurer may not ask or inquire. Um, let's see. Oh, I'm sorry, back to that subsection two. So they can ask based on whether or not the dog is known to be dangerous or vicious. So then that puts it on the owner to answer honestly, right? So, so we can't ask, you know, hey, how many dogs do you have and what breeds are they? But we can ask, uh, do they meet that criteria in statute of being considered vicious and dangerous? Is there any kind of penalty for that owner not being honest and disclosing if they uh, don't meet that definition? And is it meant to be understood that um, they would explain, knowing that your average owner may not know NRS 202.500, that that would be a specific question, meaning, you know, have they been involved in an incident two separate occasions over the last 18 months, et cetera? Um, Melanie Scheibel, for the record, and I think that this is another issue that would fall under more general insurance provisions regarding um, answering questions truthfully with your insurance provider. Um, so this bill in particular does not create a special sanction or a special penalty for answering a question about a dog owned or harbored on the property inaccurately or untruthfully. But you know, just like any other question, if there is intentional fraud or deceit, um, that could have criminal liability and could certainly have civil liability with the insurance company. Um, there are and I, something else that I think is important to uh, point out is that NRS 202.500, um, it could and, and would be utilized by the, the person who owns the dog, but it also gives the opportunity for an insurance company or another third party to um, utilize the same criteria in in developing their own position. So a way that we might see that play out is if there is a particular animal with a particular problem and the insurance company wants to raise somebody's rates, um, that insurance company could conduct an investigation, which I know sounds very formal, but what I mean is, you know, if they pulled the information from the two court cases or, or the one police report that shows that the dog meets these requirements, then that's sufficient. You don't need a certificate of viciousness. You just need to meet the, uh, the, the elements set forth in NRS 202.500. And I hope that answers your question. Madam Chair. Yes, thank you. I think um, you answered my question that at least in this legislation, we don't have any kind of penalty attached for the owner not being honest, but that might find fall somewhere else, and that's something I could follow up with insurance um, industry on. And then follow-up question. Mm -hmm. just, um, so again, reading this, and particularly the word canceling or refusing to renew stood out to me. There's nothing in this legislation that's saying that if there were a couple incidents where we found that a particular dog was found to be vicious or dangerous, that that would preclude the or prevent the insurance company from canceling. Melanie Scheibel, for the record, absolutely. There's nothing that prevents them from canceling or refusing to renew in the case that the particular dog is shown to, or known to be vicious or dangerous. 
Thank you. And I have a question just following up on my colleague's question. Um, so I know the uh, insurance companies can ask those qualifying questions. They can't ask about breed, but they can ask, does your dog have a record? Have they previously um, bitten anyone before? You know, does the county have any records of them acting dangerously? What if, if the owner, homeowner, renter, um, says no and know that and they know that indeed their dog has had a past record of vicious behavior and then an act takes place on their on their property um, what would happen is somebody would file an insurance claim and use their liability insurance but then if that if that point it, I mean if the homeowner falsely indicated on their to their insurance company that they there there was no past behavior that would you know, indicate that their dog was vicious, but we know that there was now. I mean, where's the protection for the insurance company? Uh, Melanie Scheibel, for the record, and I think that is the kind of case where an insurance company would be able to deny that claim, and that would go through the normal legal process that any insurance company, an insurance provider, and an insured person go through um, whenever a claim is denied based on inaccurate, false, fraudulent information. Um, and I'll just compare it to uh, car insurance again. You know, if I fill out, if I get car insurance by um, stating that I've never been involved in an accident and that I'm involved in an accident and I try to get my insurance company to cover it, um, that might provoke them to uh, do more record searching than they did when they first provided my insurance. If they discover that actually I was involved in a car accident six years ago, there was a judgment against me. I didn't report it to them when I first got my car insurance. I think they very likely would then refuse to cover my the accident that I'm asking to cover at this time, and they would likely win in court because I didn't disclose the earlier accident, even though they asked me about it. So it's not a perfect comparison, but I think that um, those structures of the law are already in place to protect insurance companies from that kind of fraud. Thank you, Senator. Members, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, I will move into the support testimony. Is there anyone in Carson City wishing to provide testimony and support? I, I don't think there's anyone in Carson City, but I think there is somebody on Zoom. I don't know if that's where you're going next. I. I know we have a Ms. Riggs on Zoom. Is Mr. Dixon on Zoom for testimony and support? Yes. Mr. Dixon, are you there? We might need you to turn your camera on so we can see you. Okay, I'm going to move to telephone and support, and then we can come back and check on Mr. Dixon. I'm broadcasting. Can we please check the telephone line for anyone wishing to testify and support? Yes, Chair, to testify in support on Senate Bill 103, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 747, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Yes, Chair and committee members, my name is Andrew LaPelvet and I represent the combat wounded veterans of the Purple Heart in Nevada, the 65 to 70,000 disabled American veterans state of Nevada, and I'm the current chair of the Legis United Veterans Legislative Council, which represents 250,000 veterans in our state. You're probably wondering why we're interested in this bill. Many of our veterans, both young and old, have service dogs and some service dogs in training, and they are all breeds. Um, some of those that are even highlighted in the reports today are some of the breeds. So all dogs can be friendly and all dogs can be safe and good to be around. Uh, I agree with a lot of the testimony that sometimes it's the owners that make the dogs the way they are. But we're in support of uh, SB uh, 103 and uh, all the veterans in our state need this bill to pass. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Broadcasting, next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 374. Please slowly state and fill your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and we begin.
Caller with the last three digits of 374, please press star six to unmute. Thank you, Madam Senator and the committee. For the record, my name is Elizabeth Day and I am providing testimony on support of the bill. I'm calling in on behalf of Heaven Can Wait. We are a Las Vegas based nonprofit that serves animals and their families. For the past 20 years, Heaven Can Wait has worked towards ending euthanasia in our community through providing life saving spay and neuter services, as well as high impact adoption and foster programming focusing on animals who may be considered at higher risk for euthanasia in a typical shelter environment. Unfortunately, we've found that dogs viewed to be bully breeds are more likely to be found in the shelter environments and more likely to come through our adoption program. Our top priority when facilitating adoptions is to make sure that dogs who graduate from our program find families who are the right fit for them. Although these dogs may have special needs or medical um, requirements, this does not mean that they are any less de deserving of a loving home. We also believe that prospective adopters' right to animal companionship and their ability to love and care for the pets should not be viewed as dependent on the housing situation. There's nothing more discouraging in our line of work than to find a loving and caring home for a dog, only to find that the home is unsuitable because of outdated and unfounded beliefs about the behaviours of certain breeds. In our larger effort to provide equitable accesses to resources for animals and their families, we believe that banning insurance breed restrictions will allow us to better serve our community and keep the aforementioned animals out of shelters. We can continue the work serving those who need us most without barriers that disproportionately affect the disenfranchised communities that we serve. Thank you again for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Day. I'm broadcasting next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 613. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. We'll have two minutes and we begin. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Rebecca Goff, R-E-B-E-C-C-A, G as in girl, O, F as in Frank, F as in Frank. And I'm speaking in support of SB 103 on behalf of the Nevada Humane Society, our state's only open admission, no-kill shelter. Breed discrimination issues often put people in the impossible position of having to choose between housing and keeping their pets. And the result is likely that these dogs will be surrendered to a shelter like ours. Once in the shelter, those same dogs are harder to adopt out for the same reasons, breed discrimination issues. Breeds are a guess at best, and there's simply not the scientific data to support that any breed is inherently more dangerous than another. We support this bill because we believe by removing this barrier to property insurance accessibility, it will help keep families and pets together. We thank the maker of this bill for bringing this important issue to light, and we strongly urge you to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 679. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. We'll have two minutes and may begin. Jill, J-I-L-L. -L. Last name is Dobbs. D as in dog, O-B-B-S. I am the executive director of the SPCA of Northern Nevada located in Reno. As you've just heard from others, determining a dog's proclivity to bite based on a dog's breed type or appearance alone does not keep people safe, nor does it lower an insurance company's exposure. Dangerous dog statutes, which we already have in leash laws, do. But breed discrimination does tear loving families apart, resulting in good dogs being surrendered into our sheltering system. It clearly harms dogs and Nevadans who love them. These good dogs then sit in kennels for longer periods of time because breed discrimination reduces available loving homes. There is nothing sadder and more frustrating than finding a loving home for a dog who already has a loving home. It is a depressing waste of time, energy, and very limited resources in animal welfare. Here is a real life example from dozens of examples that happens in our adoption center each and every year. A broken man comes in with his two young daughters. He is shut down and defeated. His daughters are sobbing, soaking the fur of their beloved rescue, mixed breed dog who is licking their tears away, which only makes their crying worse. 
This dog has been by the man's side as his life has taken a turn for the worse. He has lost his job. His wife died two years earlier. And the dog who comforted him and his young daughters through life's tragedies now also has to leave them because the only affordable apartment he can find doesn't allow pit bulls. His well-trained, sweet, friendly dog has a blocky head, and the landlord says they can't allow him because their insurance won't cover pit bulls. Is it a pit bull? Maybe, maybe not. But regardless, this dog is not a safety risk. He is a loving family member. But it doesn't matter because this man is now forced to surrender him and he feels like a failure and the worst dad in the world. Please pass this bill and keep Nevada's families together. Additionally, breed discrimination also reeks of housing discrimination based on race and socioeconomic status. Thank you, Ms. Dobbs. We appreciate your testimony. We do have to move on to the next caller. I have a few people signed up to testify. But if you do have your testimony in writing, I would appreciate it if you could send it to our committee manager so that she can include it in the meeting record. Thank you, Ms. Dobbs. Broadcasting, next caller, please. I'm Caller with the last three digits of 087, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and begin. Uh, thank you for letting me speak. My name is Kaylee Deerstein, K-A-Y-L-E-I-G-H, Deerstein, D-E-A-R-S-T-Y-N-E. -E. I'd like to talk in support of SB 103. Breed specific or weight discrimination can affect responsible owners who are simply looking to home some of the many misunderstood dog breeds. Such discrimination can lead to a difficult decision of either giving up their dog or potentially going homeless. The dogs that are affected are typically wonderful family dogs who score higher on temperament testing than any other favorite than many other favorite breeds. Additionally, government organizations such as the CDC and nonprofit organizations such as the American Society for the Prevention of Animal Cruelty have conducted studies that conclude that specific breed discrimination is ineffective. Furthermore, it also does not address the real underlying issue of irresponsible pet ownership. The key components of preventing dog bites or aggressive behavior are appropriate socialization and training with other dogs and people, neutering, and proper education for pet owners and other community members. As somebody who teaches and works with kids frequently at our camps, when people walk past with dogs, many kids want to go pet dogs, but we make sure to tell our uh, campers that it's important to always ask owners first and to not overcrowd the dogs. This is not always common knowledge or frequently taught. As a result, it's far more important to not recognize specific dog breeds nor a dog's weight, but irresponsible or negligent owners and lack of education. I urge you to pass this bill for the sake of both responsible owners and dogs everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Deerstein, for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller, please. Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. Thank you, Broadcasting. I would now like to come back to um, testimony and support on Zoom. Mr. Dixon, I see that you've joined us when you're ready. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the Committee on Commerce and Labor. My name is Jeff Dixon. For the record, that's uh, Juliet Exo, Echo, Foxtrot, Foxtrot, uh, Delta Indigo, X-Ray, Oscar November. I'm the, Nevada, I'm the Nevada State Director for the Humane Society of the United States, and we are in support of SB 103. Uh, breed discrimination in housing is one of the obstacles keeping pets with their people and people who want a pet. Uh, it creates more surrenders, by, and by reducing the available homes for shelter animals, it keeps them in the shelter system longer, which in turn uses space and resources that could otherwise uh, be used for other animals in needs including uh, from our state's rural areas. The path to breed neutral housing in Nevada starts with SB 103. It is not easy for customer for consumers to choose their insurance firm. We have a high share of people who don't own their homes and a high share of homeowners who live in HOAs. Landlords in HOA have their own insurance policies, leaving individuals and families to the dictates of insurance policies that they did not choose. We support breed neutrality because there's no reliable evidence, as others have uh, pointed out, showing a predictive relationship between gene genetics and bite propensity. Given that lack of evidence, what explains breed discriminatory policies? For one, it's obvious that most of these dogs listed tend to be relatively large and powerful, and they can be effective for certain activities that require aggression when they are conditioned and trained from a very young age. These include 
military and police dogs, guard dogs, and sadly, fighting dogs. But they have been conditioned and trained for those activities. Nightly News does its part. We know it's a medium that is great at exaggerating or manufacturing the illusion of a threat associated with certain activities, places, animals, or classes of people. They know a reliable ratings can be obtained from a dog bite story involving a stigmatized breed, like a pit bull type dog, a breed which in turn uh, is associated with stigmatized people. Uh, but most dog bites are not even reported. And they contribute, but they contribute to the public's perception, but they don't add up in the data, which is partly why researchers and institutions like the CDC have said they can't find a relationship between breed and risk. Um, I'll point out to the impact that these the breed discrimination has on people. There's an exhibit I submitted titled Breed Discrimination Questionnaire Responses, where I asked Nevadans to share their experiences with breed discrimination in housing. You'll find some uh, heartbreaking tales in there. Um, and it, further, breed, dis breed neutrality reduces housing insecurity for people and pets by not imposing the cruel choice on people between their pet and the best housing choice that they have. And it affirms our support for the human animal bond, which many of us here already enjoy. Uh, insurance firms have the opportunity to show their work and convince the insurance division that there is a relationship with, between bite propensity and breed. But absent that evidence, we need to be a state that opposes breed discrimination and honors the lives of animals and the strong bonds that we create with them. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Okay, at this time, we are gonna move into testimony in opposition. Is there anyone in Carson City wishing to testify in opposition? Okay, broadcasting, can we please check the telephone line? To testify in opposition on Senate Bill 103, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 902, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. My name is Mark Segment, S-E-K-T-N-A-N, -E and I represent the American Property Casualty Insurance Association. APCIA is a national insurance trade representing a broad cross-section of the insurance industry writing all property and casualty lines. APCI opposes all legislative restrictions on underwriting tools which help insurers determine risk. APCIA also opposes legislative or regulatory efforts that would require insurers to wait for a potentially devastating personal injury loss before being able to decide whether to provide or continue to provide coverage. APCIA understands the concerns of those who advocate for restrictions on underwriting based on dog ownership. Some people believe that insurers should avoid the assumption that a dog may be vicious merely because of breed and they want to ensure coverage is available for those who may face the risk of a significant liability claim. There is no evidence that dog owners are consistently unable to obtain homeowner's insurance. The proponents acknowledge there are companies that will cover these types of dogs. Consumers should always shop around for the policy that best meets their needs. Maybe a better solution is to have the Division of Insurance put together a list of companies that cover these types of dogs and post it on the division's website. We did offer these suggestions in the Senate, but they were not accepted. In the 90s, the Center for Disease Control conducted the only neutral study on the relationship between dog, between breed to dog and fatality. The study found conclusive evidence that a small number of breeds are involved in the majority of cases. Data collected by the insurance industry, which has been shared with the author previously, also highlights the impact of dog bites. According to the Insurance Information Institute, insurance companies paid more than $850 million for dog bite and industry claims in 2020. The data also shows that the average amount paid on these claims is over $50,000. Dog bite cases make up a full 25% of the cost of claims paid under the liability portion of a homeowner's policy. Insurance companies must be able to properly underwrite and rate risk. The choice to have a dog is a voluntary one. If insurers are forced to share other those homeowners with an increased chance of loss, whether it's a poorly maintained wood bunny stove, a leaky roof, a pool slide, or an aggressive dog, everyone, including policy holders who maintain their property or do not have specific dog breeds, will have to pay more to accommodate those with a controllable exposure. Nevada has a competitive marketplace with rates regulated by the Department Division of Insurance, and we recommend that people shop around for the policy that best meets their needs. Thank you for your time, and I'll answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Seknan. Committee 
Do you have any questions for Mr. Seknan? Assembly Member Tolls? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I'm sure you heard my question earlier to the sponsor, so perhaps you're the right one to ask this. Is there a penalty if, um, if this law were to be put in place and you were to ask and the insured, uh, you know, the owner of the pet, if they've had those incidents of violence that would cause um, that pet to be declared vicious or dangerous under our current statute, is there a penalty if they did not disclose or were dishonest in the answering to that question? I'm not an attorney that practices coverage law in Nevada, but I would assume that that omission could be treated under the fraud statutes, um, which exist in every state, including Nevada. However, fraud can be very difficult to prove and be, be very time, con time consuming and costly. Uh, Assembly Member Tolls, maybe we could have our legal look into that to see. Um, Mr. Quast, oh, I'm actually going to go to Mr. Quast. Looks like he has an answer for us now. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Sam Quas, Committee Council. NRS 686A.290 prohibits an applicant or other person from knowingly or willfully making a false or fraudulent statement or representation uh, in or with reference to any application for insurance. And the penalty for that is a uh, Category D felony. Thank you, Mr. Quas. We're so happy to have you back. Thank you for that answer. Madam Chair, just a quick follow-up. Yes. Um, thank you. And do you, you cited some statistics of the cost, and I'm certainly sensitive to that for the insurers, but um, do you have any evidence that you can speak to that shows if those, um, for example, the 25% of liability portion of homeowners policies that you said to have to deal with dog bites, do you have any further evidence to show us whether or not those dogs um, were involved with prior incidents, and if that might have helped be a determinant as to whether or not you should have accepted or um, rejected that particular um, insured individual? I'm not sure that the data has been broken down in that manner, but I can certainly check with the folks who collected it to see if that is, in fact, the way it's been done. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Stecknan, for answering the questions. I'm broadcasting if we could go to our next caller in opposition. Chair, there are no more callers in opposition at this time. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone in Carson City wishing to testify in neutral? Okay, seeing none, broadcasting, can we please check the telephone line? To testify in neutral on Senate Bill 103, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Thank you so much, Broadcasting. Senator Scheibel, would you like to give any closing remarks? I want to thank the committee for their time. Um, I appreciate everybody taking a, a close look at this bill, and I want to let you know that I am always available to discuss in further detail and answer further questions. I also would like to note um, that there is available on Nellis um, a, an exhibit that was uploaded in the Senate Commerce and Labor Committee on Monday, March 8th um, from the, oh no, the Canine Research Council. Um, addressing some of the, sorry, the National Canine Research Council Action Fund um, that kind of goes through the opposition's um, concerns one by one and addresses them that I would encourage you to look at. And as always, I, I remain available to you to discuss it in further detail and really appreciate your time and attention today. Thank you, Senator. I will now close the hearing on Senate Bill 103. And members, this is our last item on the agenda, public comment. Before we go to the telephone line, for those wishing to give public comment, I will just run through our public comment housekeeping to give them time to call in. I would like to remind those present and listening that the period for public comment is an opportunity to discuss general matters that fall within the purview of this committee. The public has already been given time to support or oppose specific legislation. We open and close hearings on bills so that we establish a record of the public testimony on the bill. If you direct your remarks to issues over which this committee has no oversight, I will ask you to redirect your remarks or term the, terminate them. Be respectful of committee members, other witnesses. Do not comment on testimony provided by other speakers and do not make personal attacks. 
You may always submit written remarks for inclusion in the meeting record. Before we go to the telephone line, is there anyone in Carson City wishing to give public comment? Okay, seeing none, broadcasting, if we could please check the telephone line. To take your place in public comment, please press star nine now to join the queue. Chair, the public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. Thank you, committee members. Again, it was so nice to see you all in person for our first in-person committee meeting. We will have an agenda on Friday. You guys should be receiving it this afternoon. Please be on the lookout for the meeting time. It will not be at our regularly scheduled 1.30, so just make sure you notice the meeting time. Thank you. We are adjourned.